Welcome to Jim Dalton's presentation for preparation for the new year. It is January 5th, 2015, currently 4.30 Eastern. We'll go for about an hour. My name is Julia Stewart. I'm Jim's partner here at J. Dalton Trading. I'm also a full-time trader and a, an avid or overzealous student. And uh, I'm here to uh, moderate and help you answer any questions that you need um, answered. Um, please don't hesitate to contact me, um, and I'd be happy to work with you. Um, Jim and I want to thank everyone for being here. This should be a pretty exciting presentation, and uh, we're going to do our part to um, make sure you get your time's worth for taking some time out for us, and uh, we'll have this recording uploaded about an hour after we start. So with that, please let me introduce Mr. Jim Dalton. Hi. Thank you for joining us this afternoon. Uh, this is truly a very full hour. Uh, we probably won't be a chance to cover everything I'd really like to cover, but let's start off. It's billed as preparation for the new, the new year. If any of you um, were listening to a shadow uh, trader presentation that I gave uh, a week or so ago, a couple of these charts will look familiar because nothing has changed and they're very pertinent to what is going on as the year starts and particularly what went on today. The first chart you are looking at is the yearly bar chart of the US dollar index. So as you see we were at uh, approaching the highs of going back to 2004 and 2005. This type of, when the market goes up as fast as this has gone and pressing new highs it can sometime pressure stocks. Stocks do okay when things are move along in a kind of an orderly fashion, but when they start to streak or move very quickly, it adds an added pressure. We, the also, with the dollar at this level, that can also contribute to pressuring crude oil. So right now, the first is the dollar. The dollar is near the highs uh, going back to uh, 2004, 2005. Usually when you see the dollar this strong, it is an indication that things are going fairly well here, but not particularly well in several of the other countries. In this case, we know particularly areas of, of Europe. Some people, cognitive dissonance is one of the things that really makes it difficult for traders. And we're going to talk more about that a little bit later. But sometimes what happens to traders, they get it in their mind that look at the dollar going, look how bad Europe is and everything else, and this is the world's coming to an end. What you'll find, at least historically, when I went back and looked, is when we get the kind of pressures we're seeing right now with the dollar up where it is, with weakness in Europe, the U.S. stocks may halt temporarily or stumble a little bit, but it generally does not have a lasting impact on them. They will continue to move higher. So that's, I just wanted to, and I don't know what's going to happen this time. I have no idea what's going to happen. I just try and take it a day at a time. But I just want people to not go to all of a sudden that at point the world's coming to an end, because that can be very destructive uh, to a trader. Okay, the next chart you're looking at is the yearly bar chart for crude. <clears throat> when I was on last week with Shadow Trader, the point that I made is that there is no indication well, last week, nor is there any indication yet today that there is any low that has been put in on crude. For the last several days, there's been no indication that we have a low or that the break in crude is over. Usually when a market, when a, when a trend is over, and of course this is a very strong bear trend, usually the process, we do not go from bear to bull. We go from bear to balance, and then either back to bear or to balance, or to bull. But it's very rare that we go from bear to balance. So what you've got right now is you have no sign of balance yet at this point in time. Also, markets usually end with some type of excess. 
Excess is a typical thing we see in the auction market process. The market would move to a low, and it would move quickly away from that low. We have no indication of that in crude at all. Now, to make this concept a little easier to understand, the next chart that I have is one for gold. As we all know, gold you know, has been in its own bear market. But if you look at the yearly chart for gold, you will see that we are in a we, we put in a low last year, so we do have an excess low from last year. It may get taken out later, but it hasn't been taken out yet. And we have some semblance of balance. So if you contrast that with what you just saw on crude, crude doesn't show any signs of balance or doesn't show any signs of a low yet. Where on gold, we have some sign of a balance. Last year, traded within the previous day's range. And we opened this year at least above last year's low. And we do have a slight excess on the low for gold. So the contrast of gold and crude are substantially different. Uh, crude does not show any signs of being over. And I, again, I don't look at I don't look at fundamental information, and I don't make um, studies of it, and I don't decide what the real value is. I look at market-generated information to tell me what the real orders in the market are doing. And what I see in crude right now is the real orders in the market are on the sell side. That doesn't mean that we don't look six months from now and say, what a great buy. But that, doesn't, that is not very meaningful to a short-term trader, and most of the clients that we deal with are short-term traders. But even if you're not a short-term trader, you're a long-term trader, there is no indication that there's an end to the, to the bear market in, in crude. OK? Let's take a look. Let's go to the, uh, the yearly uh, bar of the S&Ps. When you look at the yearly bar in the S&Ps, you see that the, the market has been one time framing higher for one, two, three, four, five. Um, hold on, I've got to go back up. Been one time framing higher for the past five years. Now, there's no excess on last year's high. This year, we've opened. We're, with, we're below last year's high. We're below last year's high, but there's no excess up here, and we're not really meaningful below, meaningfully below it. But at this point in time, there still is no indication that there is a top when you look at the um, yearly chart for the S&Ps. Now, before we move forward, remember the process usually is you go from bull to balance, back to bull, or bull, balance, to bear. It is very seldom that you're ever going to get a V-shape um, reversal. Now, when we go to the next chart, and we're looking at the S&P monthly bar, we start to see a little, different, a little different picture. As you remember, late last year, we had a 9, I think it was 9.9% um, correction in, uh, in the S&Ps. Everybody tells you it's not a correction because it wasn't exactly uh, 10%. I don't terribly worry about that. But what happens, the reason I'm bringing this up is we remember we just set the stage and we said what happens so often is the markets go from bull to balance, back to bull, or bull, balance, to bear. And there is a potential for the low that we saw last year to form the left-hand edge of what could potentially be a trading range or a trading bracket. Now, we don't know if that's going to turn out to be the case, but this was, the, uh, this was uh, December. January, as you can see so far, January is inside December. So as of this point in time, there's been no serious give back in, uh, in the S&Ps. Yes, the last couple of days of last week were frightening, and today was off very big. But we're going to take a closer we're going to take a closer look at today and see 
what kind of picture we get from that. So this is what the monthly, one of the potentials I have look, I'm looking at here is the potential for us to go into a bracketing market. For that to happen, we'll have to work down and at a minimum get below the December low. And of course, there's a way to go before that happens. And Jim, just a quick correction. You were meaning the low from October, not the low for the new year, just to make no, no. that distinction. No, no, start. We'd have to get below the December low. We'd have to get below the December low to even give us um, more confidence that we could go down and take out the low down at the 1813 level. I'm just taking it a step at a time. So gotcha. far, January is inside December. And when you look at January, is as, as heavy as the first few days have felt, we're really a long way from the December low. And all I'm saying is if this process is to take hold, that we start to bracket and we get down to this 1813 level, we have to continue to work fairly hard and get down and get the December low out. Um, okay? Thank all right. you. Any, any questions just on what, only on what we have covered so far? No, we're looking pretty good so far, Jim. Thank you. Okay. I'm going to go over and we're going to come back to the next chart. But before I do that, I want to take a look at today's S&P. Okay. On the, um, I don't know why I have all those in there. Um, Looking at today's S&P. You want to okay. go, Jim, to, excuse me, your blue chart? It's easier to see. Well, I had, I don't know why it was tripling everything. I think, oh, I can tell you, you can go right now, I'll show you, because it's much easier to see. Okay. Um, hover over, not that one, the lower one, the lowest. Okay, hover over the next one. Nope, 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 don't, don't, just hover over the next one. Yep. Just hover. Okay, go up to the very top one, please. Okay, we okay? No, no it, okay. Take out the top one over there, Jim. Just uh, click off today. The top time template. I think I'm okay over here. Okay. Okay, great. Okay. Now, Friday... It's still there, Jim. If you take it off, just click, hover over the top time template, and let's see what you got. Yeah, click on today. Take that one off. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Friday was a down day. You can see, let me make this a little larger. Okay, Friday was a down day, and we called the lower distribution from Friday, short-term balance. For those that are clients that have either been in the continuation program or are signing up or have signed up for the intensive that begins on January 20th, we put out a, a report at the end of each day. It's called the recap and preparation report for the following day. And then we update that report uh, in the morning prior to the opening. So the report that went out over the weekend for Monday referenced the lower distribution from Friday as short-term balance. And the report said what you really wanted to do today is you wanted to go with any directional move that took you outside of, to, of Friday's lower distribution. The next profile you see is overnight inventory, and we know that about 65% of the time there is a counter auction early in the morning relative to overnight inventory. The 35% of the time when you don't get that counter auction, that's usually a sign in this case that the market was pretty weak. So when you look at there this, this morning, we opened down below 
the lower distribution from Friday. We actually opened just a little bit below it. We traded back in with no exceptions, no acceptance back within Friday's range. And at that point in time, that we had the breakout from balance to the downside. We had the breakout from balance to the downside, and value had great odds of being truly lower. The emphasis at J. Dalton Trading is on value, not on price. Price is simply an advertising mechanism. Value is what will keep you focused. So early this morning, the market is breaking to the downside. And we'd already pre-identified that there was a very large gap here that went all the way down to the uh, 2010 level. As you can see, that gap was filled today. Now, before I go further to talk about today, because there's some important information, I want to go back and I want to cover the rally from the initial low on 12.17. Let me make this high. just a little bigger. Initial high. High on 12.17, yeah. which was the low of the gap. You'll see that the market gapped on this day from the 12, uh, what's that, tw uh, 2011 area all the way up to 2026. I mean, that's a huge gap. What that tells you is if you come back down through that area, you have to be very cautious because what gives a market hesitation coming down is if your market goes up, moves sideways, goes up, moves sideways, well, you have some backing and filling in here. When you have no backing and filling, the potential for a large break happen very quickly as time goes on is very high. Following the gap, you will see that the market also was very thin. Let me point out some other things. There was anomalies, 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 anomalies. Anomalies are jagged edges on the profile. When you see anomalies, that is usually an indication that we're looking at forced buying rather than good, healthy, long-term buying. Forced buying would be short covering. And the market just got too short when it was down almost 10%. But this was thin. We had anomalies. You see a tremendous amount of thinness in this area. Coming into Friday, the morning report that we put out on Friday morning cautioned that this area was very thin with no backing and filling. The potential to trade rapidly through that area was very high. Now let's move over, and you can see you can see what happened that the market the market traded down into that area on Thursday and you see on Friday we went all the way back down and traded through all of the single print here remember now we come into today and we still have this whole area of the gap the thinness no area where, where there's any backing and filling very dangerous uh, positions uh, for longs, the chances that you're going to get some pretty severe liquidations are pretty great. We've had that liquidation over the last few days. The gap has now been filled. One of the things we say about trading is what has happened in the past has a lot to do with what happens going forward. The area that we showed you that was so thin it didn't happen right away because the market had this momentum and it stayed up there, but it took a few days for it to come back down through that. But you needed to be aware of that so that you didn't have cognitive dissonance and just think everything was wonderful with the world because price was going higher. Now we know that we came down through a lot of that area on Friday and we came through and filled the gap today. What I want to concentrate on now is particularly today's profile. I'll make this a little bigger. We have an anomaly right here. It means it's just an area that sticks out further than the rest of the profile. We have another anomaly down here between the F period low and the F period high. 
We have another anomaly down here between the 2017-75 level and the 2018-50 level, and it's actually anomalies all the way down. So the, some of these filled in a little bit this afternoon. But usually when I see this kind of structure and I see anomalies and I see that the market does not elongate uh, and look healthy, that is usually a sign that I am seeing liquidation, I am seeing emotional trading, and let's see if we can tie that idea of emotional trading to any chart we've just looked at. Remember, one of the early yearly graphs I showed you was the yearly bar chart for crude oil, and I said, as I said last week, I see no indication that we have a low in crude oil yet. We know that the market has decided to emotionally trade off of crude oil. Whether that proves to be a correct decision down the road remains to be seen. For right now, that's what the short-term traders, and I, I stress short-term traders. We look at the market, day traders, short-term traders, short-term traders um, may hold uh, positions for up to a couple weeks. They have a lot of money. Some of the pools for short-term trading money are in the billions of dollars. Then we have intermediate-term trade, and we have long-term trade. So the long-term traders categories are intermediate and long-term. The shorter categories are short-term traders and daytime frame traders. When the market went down 9.9 percent .9 this year, it appeared to me that the break to the downside was mostly being done by the short-term traders, not by the long-term traders. And the reason I say that is I didn't have to see the volume on the downside, and I didn't see I didn't see um, good structure. I saw anomalies and things of that nature. Now, when I look at today's break, and I mention these anomalies, the reason I'm stressing this is my belief is today we saw mostly short-term trading, mostly emotional trading based upon the new lows in crude oil, but I don't think we saw any really substantial intermediate or longer-term trading. So many people immediately jump in and they say, wow, this had to be longer-term trading for the market to go down this far today. I don't think that's necessarily true. Remember, I started off and I showed the yearly, the yearly bar chart for, uh, for gold, or for um, the S&Ps, then I showed the monthly, and so far, even though we're down the first few days of this year, there's, it's not a great move whatsoever. It can be very normal liquidation. So again, this idea of cognitive dissonance, trying to get you not to start to see gloom and doom in the world, but to be more realistic and say, let's take this market just one piece at a time. When I look at today's anomalies on the downside, even though I don't have a good low, this appears to me to be liquidation, short-term liquidation. It appears to be emotional selling. I do not see an indication that I had longer-term money or intermediate-term money on the sell side. Matter of fact, because of the way the market traded and the lack of elongation and these anomalies, I wouldn't be a bit surprised if there wasn't some smarter intermediate and longer-term money that was actually using the first day of the new year uh, to be on the buy side of this market. Okay, so that's what, that's what the market looks like today and looks like going into tomorrow. We filled the gap. We filled the gap down at the 2010 level. We have a lower distribution, so this is going to be, you know, if there's anything more on the downside, we start to trade down below this distribution tomorrow. If we trade within this distribution, we're balanced. If we start to trade above this, then we've got an indication that we probably had at least a short-term low today. Okay, now I want to be, this is the bigger picture, I want to go now and show you a couple of important reference points when you're trading a day like today. These are not easy days. There's not easy days to trade. 
there was substantial volatility today in the market. But the chart you're looking at right now, and one of the things that goes along with the intensive that starts in January 20th is a continuous chat comment that I put out throughout the day. This morning, the AB period, the early break this morning, was down to where you see the B period low. The E period, Julie, I don't know why these charts don't quite line up. Um, at 11.44 today, I said for anything meaningful on the upside, you want to see the lower distribution closed by trading at 20.25.50. Oh, I'm sorry, here it is, right down, here it is, right down here, I'm sorry. It's right here. And the reason, well, here's the AB low, that was the initial low this morning. Don't mind me, if I touch it sometimes it's too sensitive. This was the first two period low this morning. The market was kind of sluggish. Then we really started to get acceleration in the third period. So there's the C period, D period. It took us down to the major low this morning. Trading is about change. And what are you always looking for is significant change in the market. On a day time frame basis, what I was looking at here and say, this is the C period is where the market broke to the downside this morning. If we couldn't trade back up to that, then I didn't see any significant change relative to this afternoon. So at 11.44, for anything meaningful on the upside, you want to see the lower distribution closed by trading at 20.25.50. Um, and that would have been during E period. Now, at this point in time, there was a double distribution. So the question is, to close the double distribution, you needed to close trade at 20.25.50. Some people will think it's closed by trading at the 25.25. Uh, I don't. I only consider it closed if I trade at the 20.25.50 level is why this price was out there. Um, we did not make that. Now, we also talk a lot, particularly because so many of our clients are day time frame traders. We talk about trade location. Trade location is defined not by where you are in the total range for the day, but it's defined by a level that you have a place for a structural stop that tells you very quickly and with a low amount of risk if you are right or wrong. The structural stop this morning would have been just slightly above the 20.25.50 level. So a short, when we fail to take that out, is what we call an asymmetric opportunity. By asymmetric opportunity, that means that your risk is very limited relative to the potential on the downside. Now, what I want to make clear, what is not part of the intensity, I do not tell you where to buy, I do not tell you where to sell. The reference up here said for anything meaningful on the upside, you want to see the lower distribution closed by trading at 20.25.50 during the period. And that didn't happen. That is your asymmetric opportunity. Later, I just reminded people that we have not traded at the 2025-50 reference, but it remains an important reference for the remainder of the day. So that was, that was one of the early indications. And trading requires a great deal of patience. So many times, people get impatient, and they just can't resist sitting there and not putting on a trade. They end up usually getting chopped up. That's all, you know, if you do this too often. If you had patience this morning, on the rally back up to just below the B period low, it wasn't a mystery. It was identified. We were way down in here someplace when I identified it. I don't know what time this actually traded up here, but there was plenty of time to identify it, plenty of time to see it. 
the important thing is to understand not just the level, but to understand why I selected B period. And I selected B period because change, serious change took place this morning once C period started to extend to the downside below B period. So if I'm going to see major change, I'm going to have to get back up above that level, and I never got back above that level, so there really was no significant change. Was there a short covering rally? Yes, but there wasn't any significant change. So value for the day was going to be, was going to be lower. Um, the value is clearly going to be lower. No change, so the trade was back again to the downside. And as you can see, that's what the market continued to do. Now, later on the, um, this afternoon, we extended again to the downside. Remember, we talked this morning about B period. Then we got new extension to the downside below B period. That eventually stopped at the D period low, at least for that point in time. The market from the D period low, the market rallied all the way back. And let me go backwards. It rallied all the way back to just a tick short of this 20, 25, 50 level that we were just talking about. So now I have another reference, and that's the D period low, which was another time when the market changed. The market came down after we failed to trade back into the B period range. The market extended again to the downside, rallied up a little bit, broke again. Now, as the market was rallying this afternoon, 1.33 Eastern Time, put out another chat. 2017.75 is the next upper daytime frame reference. And the reason it says upper is because the market was rallying from the H period low. So the next upper daytime frame reference, 2017.75 was the early morning low in the fourth period before the short covering rally. Acceptance back above, and remember it says acceptance, back above the 2017 level has high odds of triggering short covering once again. This afternoon, what time we made this chart, the market went exactly to 2017.75. There was never any acceptance, and from that level, the market made another new low. So again, it, it's amazing. There's other information here I'll share with you in just a second. It is amazing how readable some of these markets are. But part of these fortunate reads today tied into something I said earlier. And I said earlier, I don't believe that we had any meaningful selling by the intermediate or longer term time frames today. If I had longer term selling by the intermediate and longer term time frames, more than likely I'm not coming back to these exact references such as we saw up here, one tick away from it, or we see here. So I thought I had day time frame and short term trading. Longer term money, they have no idea where those references are and they could care less. The market would be more elongated, we wouldn't have all the anomalies. I thought I was looking at the day time frame in short term trading money and when that happens the markets tend to go to very exacting reference levels. And one of the things that we try and teach in the intensive is for you to understand the market in terms of the people you are competing against. Are you competing against other day time frame traders? Are you competing against short-term traders? Are you competing against intermediate and longer-term traders? Each of these time frames exhibits totally different character, personality characteristics and traits. And it's very important. Once you have some idea, I can get an idea who's trading by what the market does, as you saw today. But that's very important. Now, you don't begin to understand this from one webinar like we're doing this afternoon. 
you begin to understand it over a longer extended period of time. Early on, we did a lot of uh, seminars in hotels and uh, you know, take the conference rooms and things of that nature. And the last one we did was just a huge success. Um, we walked into the last day and said that this could be one of those days the market opened weak and closed very strong. We got very fortunate. The last 40 minutes, the market rallied 400 points. And you could see, I could see the, the days leading up to it, what was taking place and how tremendously short the market was getting. But the point, what, when I came away and started talking to Julia, one of the things that we talked about was even though there's wonderful information given out, it's very difficult to see multiple types of markets and being able to internalize all the information you're exposed to. Julia came up with the idea of doing an intensive. The first intensive we did was 60 days. So during intensive, we're on about oh, eight, eight and a half to nine hours of live trading during the week. You get the morning report and you get the, uh, um, the recap and preparation report at the end of the day. Plus, we're doing the chat comments throughout the day. So much of the real learning takes place on a lot of these chat comments that I'm just talking about today. So this idea that Julia came up with of doing the intensive, they say the first one was 60 days, and the reason we don't do 60 days anymore, Jim just doesn't have that much stamina. It takes a lot of work. You're tied to this thing all day long. So we've now cut it down. We call it a month. It's actually, I think it's, it's approximately five, five weeks. Julia always kind of edges towards giving the, uh, the client the advantage in there. But this is what's coming up now, and this is what we continually work on, being able to look inside the market, understand who we're competing against, understand what the references are for different time frames in the market, understand what structure, how to read and how in, to interpret the, the structure of the market. For example, we talked about anomalies. I don't think today was longer term selling. That doesn't mean we don't go down tomorrow, because uh, sometimes it may go down for a few days. But when you come back, you usually take it all back with a vengeance in there. OK, so um, as we I'm gonna change subjects here, the, at the end of last year, we started 1914. It sounds like it was a long time away, right? We started putting together some trading ax uh, axioms to live by in the new, in the new year. Um, and what I'm going to do is just cover a few of them here. Um, Julia, what is, what is your plan? I know we've got more of these. I'm just covering some of them here. We've got more of these, but what's, what's our plan with the, uh, with the axioms when we're done with the whole list? Julia, are you there? Yeah, I had it on mute. We're going to send out the article um, to everyone via email, so you will get it in an email. We have something else cool. A trader shared with us a quote from Ayn Rand, and it's pretty cool about traders. So we'll send that along as well. So stay tuned. We'll be there. Okay. So the uh, trading axioms, the first one, bids and offers are distributed via the continuous two-way auction process. Now, if you've followed us for any period of time, you know that the starting point for everything we do is this idea of the two-way continuous auction process. The market profile is the tool we use to record the market's continuous two-way auction process. And it was the market profile recording these auctions that you saw in the last couple of slides where we came up with some of the references we were looking at. The next axiom, Price is the market's mechanism employed to advertise the bids and offers. I will go on record multiple times in saying the biggest single error that almost every trader in the world makes is getting mesmerized and trading price rather than value. Price is nothing more than an advertising mechanism. And if you start trading price for all practical purposes, you're trading an advertising mechanism. Most people are not terribly successful in the market. And part of it is they're trading price, which is it's all over the place. Value, value is, an, is where about two-thirds of the day's trade takes place. 
it is what will ground you. If you know where value is developing, it will help ground you throughout the day. And generally, what you want to do is trade with value. For example, when we started this morning, I stressed very strongly that uh, we had the lower distribution from Friday. And we talked about any breakout from that lower distribution from Friday, which was balanced, would probably put the pressure to the downside. So when we broke out of that, where was value going to be? Value was clearly going to be lower. The way I like to trade is when value is lower, I want to sell rallies, and I want to take profit on breaks. What I do not want to do is buy breaks and take profits on rallies. And I understand that people will do that, but you know, it's, it's laughing about you know, how many times do you catch the falling knife. And you catch the falling knife, usually when value, for example, value is going lower and you continue to insist on buying the break. You're better off to sell rallies, take your profit on a break, which is a buy, put that trade back out to the short side on a rally. Then you're trading with value. Today you would have been trading with value. You would have been trading with the day time frame trend. And I suggest that that would have been a much more fruitful endeavor uh, for today. And you also saw the two references we marked melded perfectly with that idea to sell rallies and buy and buy breaks. And um, uh, sell rallies and take profit on breaks. That is different than establishing a new position on the break. The next axiom, no two prices are equal. A price made on increasing volume is quite different than a price made on decreasing volume. That's why we, we, do a we, we look at volume pretty closely to see what's really going on in the, uh, in the marketplace. Julia, what was the final volume today? I saw 3.5, but I didn't see what it was on the final runoff. Could you give me that? Sure. Uh, Two, it's uh, 2.7 okay. billion. 3.7? 2. 2. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. 3.7. 2.7 on Friday. Um, yeah, 2.7. 3.7 today. 3.7 is respectable volume on the downside, but it's not overwhelming volume relative to being off 300 and some points on the Dow and 33 or 34 points overall on the, uh, uh, in the futures. Additionally, uh, light volume on Friday and light volume uh, last Wednesday, the two days, the first two, or the last two days that the market traded. So you've got to be a little cautious. Volume on the downside has not been overwhelming. The structure has not shown a great deal of participation by the longer time frame. So again, the prices, I have some question about the prices on these breaks, that they may not be um, as meaningful as they would be had they been made on high volume. We said it earlier, successful traders trade value, not the advertising mechanism over its price. Value shorts out the daily conflicts between time frames. And again, we said we will send you when, when we get we haven't completed it, we're still we're still doing some uh, some tweaking and some window dressing on this. But when we're done with it, um, those that are on our mailing list will get a copy. Next, next axiom is profile structures allows us to see distributions. For, exa for example, a P formation is an indication of short coverage. So in other words, you have single prints are very thin on the bottom, and then kind of a loop of a P on the top, kind of an indication that you had short covering. What, what is the significance of that? Short covering is an indication of old business, not new business. Short covering can actually weaken a market as it removes a lot of potential buying power from the market. A B formation indicates a liquidating break. And let's go back and uh, um, let me see if I can escape here for a second. And if I look at today's profile, I have a B formation today. I have a long stem. And I had kind of a loop of a B on the bottom. Now that doesn't mean that doesn't mean that this is over. 
but is an indication to me that I was getting more liquidation today based on the structural formation than I was a combination of liquidation and new money selling by the longer and intermediate term time frames. If I had a, a more lethal combination of longer time frame selling, intermediate time frame selling, and liquidation by the short time frame, more than likely I'm going to get more elongation to the to the profile and more than likely I'm going to have more than 3.7 billion contracts based upon the amount of range that the market covered today. Okay. Tim, um, okay. you're going to make that full screen and we just have a couple of questions too but go ahead and finish this and we'll come back. Okay. You can do from current slide on that too, so you don't have I to. Know. I know. Okay. I, all right. That's all right. Very quickly, sometimes. Um, okay. The next thing on this chart is anomalies. Uh, within the market profile structure indicates weakness. These anomalies, they're they're weakness structural weaknesses. In other words, these anomalies are likely indicating that the shorter time frames are dominating the auction. The odds of a reversal have increased. So, for example, the anomalies were left as the market traded lower today. And when I see those anomalies as the market trades lower, that tells me that the odds of a reversal, or at least trading higher to take, take some of the pressure off all of the shorts, is, has increased. That does not mean it's going to happen immediately. We also have prominent and very prominent POCs. Uh, they often help us differentiate between time frames. For example, rising price, prices with prominent, very prominent POCs below them may indicate that the shorter time frames are carrying prices forward. In other words, if you're going up, you, you, if the market's going up in a very healthy manner, you don't want to see very prominent uh, points of control. A point of control is the longest line leading, reading from the left to right, left to right of the profile. On a healthy day, you may see what the longest line is, and it may be a little longer than some of them. It may be in an area, but it won't be, it won't stick out like a sore thumb. When you have a prominent or very prominent point of control, it doesn't take but a second to look at it and say, wow, you'll see that prominent point of control, and yet the market trades higher. When that happens, that doesn't mean we're not going higher, but it oftentimes is an indication that it's going higher on weaker support. Let me see if I can go back over here. I'm going to come back up, leading up into, here's exactly what I'm talking about. Okay, on the 22nd of last year, the market opens right around the green dot. The low is put in early in the morning. The market attempts to go higher all day long. It leaves a very prominent point of control. You can see how easy it is to see that point of control. Did the market go higher the next day? Yes, it did. Again, a very prominent point of control. So what does this tell me? This tells me the market's going higher because markets get momentum and the momentum traders are in there carrying the market higher. I had a poor low down here, very important. The market does trade higher. I have another prominent point of control. Not very prominent, it's a half day. But the market's struggling. It goes higher and we, we're getting no elongation on the upside. We're getting no elongation. When I look at that, I look and I, people a lot of times get misled. Price looks strong. You look at price, you made a new high. This was an all-time high in the market. And I don't think that's going to last. I think we'll take that out uh, this year, uh, maybe in the first quarter, um, maybe sooner. But I think for now, a lot of times these poor highs can be an indication of the market that got too long. But going up, these very prominent and prominent points of control were an indication to us that the market was struggling a lot as it was going higher. And it's getting very, very long. What you're seeing today is you're seeing that that market has taken back so much of that. So there were good indications in there that the rally to the upside wasn't all that healthy. Yet, you know, people tend to have a tend to go with the latest in price and um, 
and, and it goes until it stops. And when you're thinking about the odds, people get frustrated sometimes because they say, well, this market's no good. They want it to change right away. Sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes it takes a catalyst. You know, this catalyst turned out to be oil, the dollar going higher, oil weaking, kind of the catalyst that helped this market correct. Okay, Julia, let me stop there. Um, yeah, let me see if I get this right from the be Oh, I didn't want to go from the beginning. I wanted to go from current slide. I'm sorry. Uh, but go ahead and uh, fire some questions that are, uh, that are hanging around out there. Great. Thank you, Jim. Okay. For, let's start here. On the B profile shape, would high volume give you a better indication of longer term money uh, quietly buying into the break? Not necessarily. It could. It easily could. It could also be, it could just, it could be uh, uh, shorter term people buying. But more than likely, if you go down and you get high volume down there and no carry through the downside, it's probably a pretty good indication that there was some more serious money on the buy side. We saw this as the market broke down that 9.9 percent .9 last year. My guess is the longer time frame was buying all the way down because we saw some uneven structure down there. But it's a it's a good it's a good question. But remember, it, that's only a starting point. Once the, if that's a starting point, then if the market starts to rally, you always still have to be able to monitor for continuation. Part of the reason we start with the very first thing we talked about is the continuous two-way auction process. Markets will fool you sometimes. They look like they're going down, and you say, oh boy, you see the signs for a rally. But yet, and you were right, the market rallies, but the rally is pretty puny. Ah, be careful, because we now may turn back down. So it's always monitoring for continuation. Another question. Great. Thank you, Jim. My trading has improved a lot since I read the, um, the read the market the, your way. Thanks a lot. I still have one remaining big problem, which stops my progress and still gives me inconsistent results. My problem is my entry point trade location. I trade oil, and there are a lot there is a lot of noise around key structural levels which stops my um, you know trading from being consistent I have used every possible type of chart uh, small time frame point and figure etc volume chart to get an edge without any success it's frustrating because my reading is really good but I can't profit from it I know you're not talking about this particular specifically um, but how can you enter trades um, you know using the market profile and not get chopped out well, the first thing I would suggest, um, and I'm going to uh, I'm going to go to my CQG chart here, is when you tell me, and I believe me, I have been through this a lot of times with people. When you tell me that you are using numerous charts and views in order to uh, uh, get into your entries. That in itself is probably a killer. Um, I don't know why, crew. This isn't looking correct to me. Um, is it in 15 minute, 15 minute increments? The, the oh, there we go. There, okay. there it's a little bit. Great. There we go. Thanks. Um, let me spread this out just a little bit. There's been some great trades in crude. I don't know what, what, what this isn't today's crude. I mean, where am I? It's on a yearly, I think, or something. You see the. the oh yeah. The, okay. Thank you. Okay. So now, let's take a look. We're into, we're into today's profile. So first of all, what did crude do this morning? Crude gapped lower, a large gap lower overnight. Where are some of the trades I see in crude? One, you could have in um, 
the C period rally did not take out the A period high. That, that is a potential short. You don't have a particularly good high, but if you vision, visualize all the single prints from the gap uh, are like single prints. So that's a, that's a potential trade. Um, another trade, when D period breaks below C period. So you've got the, the C period break, and when we break below the C period, that's a potential short on crude. You go down because you're with the trend, you're with the trend, you're with the gap, you're with the auction, and that's a potential trade. When you look back and you get you get a big break in E period, F period gives you an inside day, an inside bar. The breakout to the upside in F period is a potential trade. It wouldn't work. You got a couple ticks and you're you know you're whipped out of it pretty quickly. But it gave you a place for a stop. Then you get an inside bar in J period, and the break to the upside in J period is a legitimate trade. Um, when K re-enters here, it's a legitimate trade. I'm great. It's a that was a very wild market. But one of the things that I have noticed that has given people a lot of trouble, and I dealt with this somebody last week. They had they were saying, well, you know, I believe in the profile, but I use a three-minute and five-minute uh, charts for for uh, for moves, and I say, what well, when you do that, it gets you so focused on the very short term that you lose the bigger perspective. If you take crude oil today, the perspective was all trends are down, the market gapped lower. So what are you looking for? Generally, what are you looking for? You want to trade with value. So you know you fail up here, that's a trade with value. D is a trade with value. Um, you know E F if one time frame's down, then it balances. You know, and um, you know, then you you ground the way back up. You get a short covering rally in J, doesn't get the high. But there are other things, and we can't spend any more time on crude. But there are other things to do. I can look at crude. In fact, I was watching crude today, because I was, and I'm going to I'm going to collapse this. And one of the reasons I was watching crude, and let me spread this out, because I was also seeing anomalies in crude early on which led me to believe that I had pretty good odds that I was going to get a late short covering rally in crude. I did get the late short covering rally. Now, it gave way again, but I was watching the anomalies, which told me that most of the money going to the downside was emotional money, and I wasn't surprised. I was actually looking for the short covering rally in crude. So there's a lot of things you, you can do. It, the same principles in crude are applicable to the same principles in the s and P's. We look at structure, we look at anomalies, we look at gaps, we try and trade with uh, with value. Okay, I spent a little too much time there. Julia, go on. What else have we got? Thank you, Jim. Um, you often talk of the dollar when trading the s and P's. Could you elaborate on how we should be using the U.S. dollar, um, what that relationship entails, what we should be looking at? No, I, I don't often talk about the dollar when we're trading the S&Ps. Um, we used to back when he has the field division period, DVDs. There was a period when they were coupled up. There was a period up. of time when, and, and one of the things I said in there, I said, this is what the market's doing. The market right now is was trading counter to the dollar. That's what it was doing. I, and I remember one day in a seminar, I said, I've looked at this on a research basis going back many years. I don't see that correlation. I don't see that correlation in a long period of time. It's just simply something traders got in their mind, and it worked for a period of mind, time. Traders are always looking for patterns. One of the worst things you can do off very often is look at another market in order to trade the current market. Now, I will draw attention to what I said earlier. Nothing is an absolute. When you get spikes in the dollar like we're getting to the upside right now and spikes on the downside in crude, those major moves sometimes will jar the short-term traders uh, in, in stocks, in trading stocks, and it can clearly add to the volatility. Right now, traders have decided that lower oil, oil going lower should put stocks lower. I can tell you there'll be a point in time at which all of a sudden the same thing that they were doing today in selling stocks, they'll be buying the daylights out of stocks. Trading is a game. It is not a science. It is understanding 
the art of trading and understanding the craziness that goes on. Right now, part of that craziness is that traders, short-term traders, no longer-term traders, short-term traders have decided that weak crude is going to put stocks lower, and that's what they're doing right now. So we don't we don't live in a blind. We, we're aware of that, but I can assure you that there will be a time that same move in oil will put stocks higher. That's what they're doing today, and that's kind of what they're getting in trouble. They went down today, and you weren't really getting any long-term money in here. You were getting the short-term emotional money thinking, I don't have to trade. All I have to do is sell the S&Ps because crude oil is going lower. Okay, a couple more questions. Yes, Jim. I mean, looking at this profile today, how it seems like uh, from yes, um, I think it was Friday, um, where it looked like the 45 line, you know, they were selling off that reference 20, the 17 there, and the 45 line was forming late in the day. I guess it didn't have time except for the last 30 minutes to really see the rally no, come in. Let me explain, just in case there's people who are new. The 45 degree line is when you can draw a, a line from the low up to the point of control, and that, that line is kind of a 45 degree angle. What that's an indication of is the, the, the green line up here is the longest line reading from left to right. That's an indication. It's called the point of control. It's also it's a better way to think about it. It's the fairest price at which business is being conducted. The point of control is kind of a nebulous term to me. The fairest price at which business is being conducted is much more meaningful. So if I'm saying this is the fairest price at which business is being conducted, and yet they keep selling the market down and rallying, what are they doing? The traders are selling short in the hole. In other words, if this is the fairest price and they're selling down here, they're selling below the fairest price. We call this being short in the hole. And normally when this happens several times, as it did, we went down in, uh, we went down in H period, we went down in J period, and K and L, but yet the point of control stayed up in here. That's usually an indication that there's emotional trading and traders are selling every rally and they're blindly selling below the fairest value of the day. When they sell below the fairest value of the day, the traders are price. getting caught short in the hole. And mm -hmm. as you can see, right now we've traded all the way back up here late this afternoon and we're currently trading at the 2018 level. So I do think they got short in the hole. But now, we the same thing same was on thing Friday happen, too, excuse me. But that same thing can same happen. Same thing happened Friday, and the market did a late, the market did a late rally all the way up to, all the you way up split to split that. Level. Yeah, if you expand and that, it will show. So it's again. Remember what we're talking about is learning to understand the market in terms of the behavioral characteristics of the people you are competing against. That's where you get. That's where you get your edge. Now you're not going to learn that. You're not going to learn that quickly. That's why this idea of the intensive is such a powerful idea, because we get a chance to spend several hours a week with you, eight to nine hours a week, plus the continual chat with you to explain these concepts. It takes a while for them to gel, and it takes a while for you to, to get rid of this fear of price moving all over the place, and, and, and oh, look at that, look at that, and understand, okay, where's value, where's my point of control, where's my references, what's really going on in the market. Where are traders getting themselves in trouble? When I see the 45 degree line, I say, what are they doing? They're getting themselves in a lot of trouble. Poor lows. The first book I wrote, uh, Mind Over Markets, um, talked about um, you know, buying tails and selling tails. The second edition that came out uh, a year or so ago talks about the information contained with a poor low or a poor high. A poor low can mean a market is too short. That's what I think today was. The market was too short. Now, this is positive for a short-term move. It's negative going forward. So it can mean two things. But this is an indication the market was getting too short today, and so was the point of control up here. We got the short covering rally. But the other thing it tells you is this was old money buying down here, not new money, You know, because it was the short covering. Old money buying is a lot different than having this low made because new money came in to buy. It's a very fine point, but a very important point. Uh, Julia, let me take uh, just a couple more questions, and I think we're uh, probably past our period. 
Okay, great. Thank you, Jim. What would you consider large enough, you know, New York Stock Exchange volume to be meaningful to the downside, you know, versus the 3.7 million today? You know, when you start to see bigger money, I think you're also going to see the profile elongating. You're going to see a lot more than just the volume, but do you have a number for her that maybe to give her a better no, it's, idea? No, it's right. It's not, you, you, Julia, you said it perfectly. It's not just volume. It's the total context. You'll start off in the morning. You'll, you, first of all, when the longer term money is selling, they don't generally butcher a market. This market was pretty well butchered today. Just automatic selling, and that's why we got the anomalies in here. So that usually doesn't happen. And I say this with some confidence. I ran an institutional trading desk, and I know how larger orders are, are handled. We don't butcher a market. And if the market's doing too much of this, a lot of times we'll just sit back, we'll come back another day. In there. So when I see this, and I see all these single prints, that's morally, mostly a sign I'm getting... Um, emotional short-term money. Oh, I got to get it right now. I got to sell it right now. Or I'll never get another chance. So that's usually a, a sign of that. I will usually get elongation, uh, but not overly elongated. Today was overly elongated. I won't get the anomalies. It'll be smoother. And on top of it, I will have fairly good volume, and I'll close closer down to the lows than, um, and I spill to the downside late rather than closing back up here. So it, there's a whole series of things. But, you know, if you start, and, and the volume is relative, uh, what would be good volume in one period of time may be less in another time. Right now, it would probably take over $4 billion, uh, to be really significant. But it would be $4 billion, it would be the right structure, um, you know, it would be elongation, it would be where we close, and, you know, and that type of thing. So it's not one thing. But, Right now, probably be over four billion. Um, you know, would be more significant. Okay, one more question. You mentioned trading value, not price. I get confused on days when the value is moving lower, but the price is moving higher. Do you have any tips for handling such days? Um, I usually am the day time frame trader, um, or I usually stick with the day type I am seeing. Is that wrong? That's interesting. Well, today, I mean. Uh, that's a t um, Today it was a breakout you know, of rain. I, I, don't, I don't know examples of what you're talking about. Um, well, it's usually what we were talking on the call with Jim yesterday, Jim, where you have the, you know, you might open higher and price is trading lower, but value is still building higher, or the inverse, we open lower, you know, relative to the prior day, but tra price is trading higher. You know, it can... It's not based on price. It's based on on. But he's saying he follow. He gets confused when the price is moving pretty much inversely to the value. No, well, that's that happens, and um, and and then value he has to catch up or not. Um, so I mean, here right now, here's value to this. The value on this day was clearly lower. The value on this day was clearly lower. The high was never taken out, even though we settled here at a point of control. I'm um, spread this day out. Um, Pull it down so they can see the value from the day you're comparing it to, too, Jim. You got to slide well, it. Way over, way yeah, over. well, they couldn't see it. Okay. But this, the trades on this day were still to sell rallies, take your profit on breaks. So the market, you, you, you're selling the rally, taking your profit on the break. You know, you're selling the breakout. You're taking your profit on the break. You're putting it back out. I mean, you still trade it that way. Here's value the following day. Um, Here's value to follow. Where's value? Overlapping to lower. Value was overlapping to begin with. Then you've got your breakout to the downside. So I think, I think when I hear that question, my, my guess is you're getting, um, still letting price have too much of an influence and not sitting back and uh, really making a determination where value is going to be. The tricky part comes in where let's say price opens below value and starts to trade higher. And then value, and then price gets into the previous value area and the market starts to elongate. So when you when the day is over, value is overlapping or maybe even overlapping to higher. Those are the trickiest days. But when that happens, what you'll see, for example, if the market opens below value and starts to trade higher, 
generally you will see the market start to one time frame higher. And when you see the market one time framing higher, that's a pretty good indication that you have some pretty serious buying underneath the, uh, the market. And, and in that case, value moves to price. Price always moves faster. Volume of value is slower moving. But you take a look on the breakout here. Uh, value was overlapping. But once we broke to the downside, where was value going to be? It's going to be overlapping to lower. OK. Um, yeah. Julia. Um, anything that, else, or is that? Yeah, we have a couple. But if you leave it on the window trader chart, it's also too. You know, value uh, is one observation, and that's when you can only glean so much of that. And then you move on to volume. You look at your daily bars. You see if there's a target down there. You know, like now we got this gap underneath. So you, you kind of have to build on that, and it can only tell you so much. Particularly when we're day trading, I would suggest the futures volume at price where you see here. You know, you can monitor in the one time framing and anomalies forming and that sort of thing to build that into your value observation. Um, yeah, it, it, it's a series of things. It's, mm -hmm. Remember, there's no real learning without context. And, and that's the beauty of the intensive, that we have time to more fully develop these ideas. And as you see with the chat comments, the, the chat comments are continuous. Let me put one up here for a second. So I, you know, I, I started this morning, and the chat was open at uh, you know 9 a.m. And you see, you know, chat comments throughout the um, throughout the day, uh, trying to give you, you know, um, some kind of as close as close as we can be to being next to you. Individual mentoring is extremely expensive, and and we understand that. Oh, an awful lot of traders are undercapitalized uh, due to a lot of pain they've taken in the in the marketplace. So when Julia came up with the idea, this idea, it was a sensible, economical way to get as close to having a mentor as you could possibly get. Do we do it for a lot of people at one time? Yes, we do. That's the that's the economics of it. They say I couldn't do 60 days; I could do 30 days uh, in there, or you know, do a month. But that's what we're trying to do. And, and nuances, it's one thing to understand the, the broader idea of the uh, continuous two-way auction process and the profile and how it records the two-way auction process. But it's the nuances that really make a difference and separate out you know, the really good traders from the traders that don't quite turn the corner. The, Internist. I use a, an internist in, in Scottsdale. He's got this reputation for being one of the best around. My daughter got him for me one time when I was having some problems. And he asked me one day what I did. And I told him, well, you know, I, I wrote a book on trading futures. And he laughed. He said, uh, he said, well, that wouldn't be very helpful. And I didn't argue with him. I wasn't going to do that. I, I said, well, why would you say that? And he said, well, he said, it's, it's about nuances. Well, you know, if you're one of the top internists in Scottsdale, um, what do you, what, where are you good? You, it's the nuances that make the difference. The, the really catch the nuances, they catch more cancers. Uh, they don't catch all of them. You know, I asked him that question one day, but they catch more than, than some because they're looking for nuances. Trading is the same thing. You still, you have to have the, the basics. You have to have the basics. You have to understand the continuous two-way auction process. You have to understand how it's recorded on the profile. You have to understand the importance of value versus price. Now, that's huge. Don't take that lightly. But once you get those basics down, then you start, you start, looking, at, you start looking at the nuances. One of the things that Julia was telling me the other day, she's gone back and reading the book Psycho-Cybernetics, which was uh, you know, very popular uh, years ago. But it's still so many of the things she brought up are so applicable to what goes on today. And she was relating to me the other day. I've made comments that a lot of times when I'm in the shower in the morning thinking about nothing else other than hot water running on me, all of a sudden an idea or a solution to something I was thinking about comes in my mind. I made the comment that 
I go out and I ride the bike about 10 miles in the morning, and it's not uncommon. I'm riding the bike. I'm looking at my, you know, my measurements uh, along, marks along the road to see, you know, am I on schedule? Am I increasing my time, etc.? And all of a sudden, something will pop into my head. Why? Because my mind was clear of all the clutter. Well, one of the things that Julia brought up from from the book was that it takes one. It takes a great deal of passion if you're going to be good at something. It takes a great deal of passion. But once you, the passion isn't enough, then it takes really intensive study that you learn everything there is to learn about. But the tricky part was then relaxing and let it go so that your subconscious can go to work on it. And when she said this, it, it's exactly what we talk about. Why you, you see so many times top athletes set records when they've been sick. I think Peyton Manning did one not too long ago. I think he had a couple of injuries, and he goes out and throws seven touchdown passes. And I know Michael Jordan, several of them were, his records were on days that he wasn't expecting much of himself because he didn't feel well. So sometimes it's, it's, as she says, has the passion for it, then the intense study, and then just being able to sit back, let the subconscious take over, and begin to go with the flow of the, uh, of the market. Okay. Yes. Thank you, Jim. Great. Um, we have, just to round this out, we have a question on excess and, you know, what you were talking about with the yearly charts. Um, we have a question on the excess, really, in its overall. Don't, don't, wouldn't we need to see excess even on a balance before a reversal? And I think he's talking more in the longer term trend, not necessarily a yearly chart, but, you know. Let's take, let's go back, I'm going to put a bar chart up of the S&Ps. So then I'm going to go and say, what we don't have right now, we have, we have excess if you look at the, uh, the monthly. Let's go to the weekly. We have no excess if you look at the weekly. That high is at uh, 2088, 28 is about the same, I don't know, 208870, 208850. So there's no real excess up there. Now, where that's important, there's a couple of caveats. If you have no excess, and then a day or two later, the market gaps lower, that gap can serve as excess. That's one. We didn't. We have close to a gap. We have close to a gap on the 30th. Let's go back and look at the 30th. Well, you actually do. Depending on the E mini, didn't have it. But if you look at um, if you look at the full size contract, we actually do have a gap on the 30th. So this would fit the pattern: no excess on the high, but you did gap, and that gap can substitute for excess. I've seen that happen a few times over the years. So again, it doesn't always have to be by the numbers. Generally speaking, however, if in fact you get this situation, we have no meaningful excess on the high, and then you start the break to the downside with a gap. That is normally liquidation. And you'll see that over a period of time, the market will come back and take out this high. Now, I've seen the market go down 10, 15% before it did that. If you had clear excess on the high, where it was very obvious that you had longer term selling on here and some elongation, Sometimes we don't come back to those markets for years. Uh, so there's, there's a lot that goes with that. But the, in, in, unless you're doing really longer term trading, you sit there and you're better off to say, okay, you can get a liquidation break from any time. And I think right now we're seeing liquidation. I think there's a pretty good odds we come back and take out the high uh, before too long. You know, we did that last year. We, we put the high in last year on December 31st. And we didn't turn around and go back and take that high. We didn't start back up until halfway through February. 
So you can get liquidation, and there's always strange things that go on in the in the market. Okay, thank you. Julia? Yes, thank you very, uh, very much, Jim. That's great. Um, so I guess that's... Um, let's just see. Do you have any time? Can I ask one more question? And then we'll keep it going. Okay, since we have a poor record uh, high up here on the S&Ps, if you look at Window Trader, then we should see a rally and an excess day before a new bear market, correct? If we can look at the Window Trader while you're doing that, Jim, with the... Or, okay, if you want to look at that. When, you know, He's talking about the long-term excess high in the S&Ps. When you get, here's what traders get into trouble sometimes. They get in their mind, well, there's no excess on the high, so therefore we've got to go back there before we really start a bear market to the downside. Well, like I say, I've seen liquidating markets that have gone 10 to 15%. And then, of course, it goes back uh, to there. But, you know, to most traders, that's a lot of pain. My suggestion is take the market one piece at a time. Take it in small chunks. If you take it in small chunks, more than likely, you're not going to get in over your head, and you're not going to get in large trouble. I have known too many large traders, too many hedge funds. Remember, I used to, I used to uh, run the hedge fund research for uh, UBS Financial Services. I've got a lot of experience of what I've seen. And you get people that they get something locked in their mind and they're not letting go of it. That cognitive distance can be very big. I believe if you take things a small piece at a time and say, okay, that's why I start with the monthly, then I go to the weekly and the daily, and I'm always trying to keep track of what is really going on in the market on a shorter term basis. So I don't get locked in and say, well, there's no excess on the high. So therefore, before a real bear market starts, I got to go back and take that high out. It, that, that, can, that can be a death trap. You know, do I, do I think there's a pretty good chance we go back there? I do. But I'll tell you what, I'm certainly not building my portfolio on it. I am sitting there trading a, a, a short term a piece at a time. The other day, I looked at all the thinness. I said, okay, we talked about that earlier. We had the thin market, we had the huge gap, and pretty good chance we go fill that all in. I looked, we, we put a chart up here earlier, and it showed the, uh, that monthly break on the monthly bar where the market was down 9%, and we said, you know, maybe that's the, maybe that's the start of the, uh, of the, of the S&P starting to balance. It's certainly a possible scenario. But even going back, if it went all the way back there and then came up, it's still a 10% break. That's a killer to some people. So all I'm saying is just take, the, in my opinion, take the market a piece, a piece at a time, and I think the economic survival rate will be much higher. Yes, okay? yes thank you, Jim. Uh, as, we, as we said, uh, this thing, this crazy thing, as we said, when we get done with all of the... Um, um, all of the trading axioms, uh, we'll put them together and, and we'll send them out to you. Um, and there'll be, there's only, we've only got seven or eight of them done now. We've got more on the drawing board that have done. We just haven't, we just haven't rounded them all out. But I think you'll find that a very meaningful piece to reflect on and is a good way to, uh, um, to get started for, uh, for the new year. Um, I see Julia's got another quote there for uh, cognitive distance. Creativity requires the courage to let go of certainties. Uh, and that's sometimes when we get in really big trouble. We are so certain that something is going to happen, we're not letting go of it. And uh, as I've said, and Julia brought this up when she was mentioning this the other day, um, years ago when I was a manager in a brokerage firm, I used to uh, review the... Um, the orders that the brokers were putting in. And I knew the broker I was going to have the biggest problem was, was the broker that only had one idea. And normally when the broker had only one idea, it was wrong. And it's the same thing with, uh, with traders. So once again, um, remember we've got the intensive starting on the, on the 20th. Um, it's, uh, our intentions are to give you as much mentoring on an economic fair price as we can. It includes, you know, eight and a half to nine hours of seminar like we're doing right now. 
uh, every week. It includes a report at the end of the day, uh, recap preparation report, update in the morning, and the constant chat, uh, one-way chat comments you see the out today. Plus, we do an awful lot of email support. Unfortunately, we, we can't always get back to all the emails in as timely a manner as you would like because the, uh, uh, the audience has is, is gotten fairly large. Uh, but we do our best, and sometimes if I see a series of questions that are really grouped together, what I'll do is I'll answer them through the chat. I'll answer them in the chat comment so that the answer gets out there. So I'm, I've got the emails to my right throughout the day, and I'm scanning them. And a lot of times if I see some, I can answer them on the chat. I will do that in order to make them available for everyone. So once again, Julia, thank you, and thank all of you for, uh, for joining us tonight. Okay, great, and thank you very much. We appreciate the extra time, and thank you, everyone, for being here. We'll get this recording uploaded. Our next webinar is January 15th, so you can see that at our site and get signed up. Okay, thank you. Have a wonderful evening. God be with you. Bye-bye.